Born December 1st, 1964, Todd Rogers has in different forms been considered one of the oldest professional gamers, as well as the oldest world record holder. If you are A, already familiar with his past, or B, listen to everything that I'm about to share today, you may start to question that statement entirely. I don't want to slap some statements together or just talk about one or two events, no. I want the wider picture of this entire situation and this one human being. Today, join me as I explore the never-ending rabbit hole of possibly one of the sketchiest and most mind-boggling people in the history of gaming, Todd Rogers. Before we get into the past of this mysterious and sketchy person, you know who isn't sketchy? Today's sponsor, Extra Wallets. Today I am rocking the Napa Black Parliament Wallet. There's plenty of great features with these slim designs, including built-in RFID protection. If you happen to lose your wallet, just like Todd claimed people lost proof of his world record tapes, well, no worries. With compatible location trackers that connect to your phone, Someone as forgetful as me never has to worry again. If what you heard sounds great, then I have a deal just for you. If you go to shop.extra.com slash storester, which will also be in the description, you can get up to a 15% discount on these sleek and modern products thanks to Extra Wallet. Disclaimer. Everything mentioned today has been heavily researched, and I'll even be including this video script as well as the contained research in the description. Everything presented and stated in this video beyond the linked research is only my opinions. Please don't pull a Billy Mitchell over this project. Or I guess a Todd Rogers? Oh, don't worry, we'll get to that in sure time. In 1979, the marketing department at Atari released a memo to its programming team which listed every single game Atari released over the past year. This was intended to be shown for motivation, with the core intention being to show programmers what kind of games were doing better and where to go moving forward. Four developers at Atari got quite a different message from this memo. David Crane, Larry Kaplan, Alan Miller, and Bob Whitehead. When crunching the numbers, these four guys alone were responsible for upwards of 60% of Atari's sales, or roughly $60 million. The truth though? All four of them were only making roughly $22,000 a year. Quite a gap from that $60 million. See, the video game industry was originally based on the normal toy industry. Designers were paid an exact salary, and said designers' creations were owned by a company. These four guys wanted to change that, and thought the gaming industry should be more closely modeled to the music or film industries, where the actual talent got more royalties based off the success of their creation. All four walked into the office of Atari CEO at the time, Ray Kasser, and argued for proper royalties. With Atari and its CEO being tied into Warner Communications, who wanted to keep production costs and salaries as low as possible, this offer was flat out rejected. All four programmers quit and would end up starting the beginning of what would turn into Activision. Over the following two years, Atari would try suing the newly formed Activision, but ultimately had to settle out of court. Activision was allowed to be a third party video game developer for the Atari 2600, which was now labeled as an open platform. While Activision does still exist today, we are strictly going to be talking about 1980s Activision. All the original founders left the company by the mid 80s, and Activision itself went through ownership changes as well as bankruptcy difficulties between the 90s and the 2000s. Why did I just explain the beginning of Activision to you? Well, 
The beginning of Activision really overlaps with the beginning of Todd Rogers as a video gamer. In 1981, Activision started sending out newsletters to fans that included upcoming titles, backgrounds of the game's designers, high score achievements, and many more. This was simply called Activision's Newsletter. This newsletter would continue till fall of 1983, and what I mostly want to look at between these newsletters are the sections mentioning top players and high scores. The first few newsletters had multiple of what they called club memberships. If you submit photographic proof of a high score among a certain list of games, you could join said club. All you needed for proof was some type of picture on camera film. They even had an entire section teaching people how to properly take TV photographs at the time. Todd was a typical high school senior at the time, and in Volume 2, he was featured on the Activision Ski Team for getting a 27.64 in Game Mode 3, and on the World Class Dragster Club for being one of the three people to achieve a 5.57 time. Todd would continue to be a regular in these newsletters, being featured under other games, such as Centipede and Grand Prix. There's one game that I want to focus on though, Dragster. Let's just quickly analyze each record according to each volume of the newsletter. Entering Volume 1, we see two people were tied with a time of 5.61, a father and son duo, Chuck Hunter Sr. and Chuck Hunter Jr. Volume 2 had three people tied at a 5.57, Todd Rogers, Greg Nichols, and Tony Armstrong. Volume 3 was the exact same, and Volume 4 doesn't state the name, but says that a fourth person got a 5.57. Volume 5, things shift with William Stewart and Kevin Cook. We'll, we'll just say Kevin K, tied at a 5.51. Volume 6, Todd became the third to get a 5.51, and the final volume, number 7, didn't mention Dragster at all. For years upon years, and even decades at this point, 5.51 was considered the definitive record time in Dragster. But there's something weird here. Why is Todd Rogers the only one that seems to get this credit, and not William or Kevin? Well, when asked later on about his time, Kevin didn't seem to care too much, and even claimed to remember a 5.43 time being possible, but not being 100% certain about it. He doesn't seem to remember too much about the situation at all, and didn't care much even in the 80s. William, on the other hand, there's not too much to say about. I seriously couldn't find a single thing about this person, and if you're out there, William, you're hiding quite well. Todd, on the other hand, is quite... Vocal, to say the least. Todd was not a stranger to cameras, and once you find one Todd interview, you find three more. He was even featured in the infamous King of Kong film that focuses on one of my best friends. But you see, this goes deeper than just Dragster. That's the game that everyone talks about, but there's so much more. As early as the 2000s, people were already questioning other scores from Todd. Going back to the Activision newsletter, in Volume 6, Todd is credited as getting a 32.74 time in Barnstorming, a really simple game with four different game modes. The main objective is to aim your plane through a certain amount of barns based on what game mode you're playing. This game is a pure test of movement as any slight adjustments or errors will slow you down. Later in 1986, this score was randomly republished as a 32.04, which allegedly resulted from a coffee stain on the original proof of the score. Yes, I'm not kidding you, this erroneous time would be reprinted going forward, and Todd thought the coffee stain was a good enough reason to claim it as a legit time. In the year 2000, he submitted 32.04 as the record of Twin Galaxies, a notable gaming leaderboard. By 2002, people were already investigating this time heavily, and no one could match him at the time. This led to multiple people editing the ROM of the game to remove every single obstacle, which allows you to fly in a straight line. 
Remember, any slight movement normally slows you down. With every obstacle gone and no adjustments being made, people could only get a 32.07. A 32.04 was impossible without obstacles, and even more of a stretch with obstacles present. Over the years, some people were able to beat his original 32.74 time, but couldn't come anywhere close to the 32.04. There was no way this time was legit. Even a tool assisted run in 2017 got a 32.69. Quite a far stretch from Todd. This time even was questioned by Twin Galaxies referees such as Wolf Marrow. Ultimately, this was swept fully under the rug and Wolf later would speak up about how poorly he and his brother were treated just for questioning Todd. Supposedly, his brother had caught Todd red-handed entering his own records into the leaderboards, and not even other referees at the time were allowed to do this. Todd later would call out Wolf's accusations, claiming every ref had the same access and privileges. Todd also took responsibility for entering his own scores, but only once. Of course he couldn't have done it any more than that. As we get further on though, it may be quite hard to believe that. Another Twin Galaxies ref, my boy Ronnie C, stated the 32.04 time was fake, but had a 32.77 time on a VHS tape. Ron also insisted that Todd would play barnstorming at a public event that would be captured on video for the entire world to see. Well guess what, you're not going to believe this, but the time came around for Classic Game Expo 2002, and Todd never played the game a single time. There are claims though that after the event, Todd captured a 32.5 on VHS, which of course never surfaced in the slightest. Years later, Todd still claimed this as legit, and went as far to suggest that maybe he got his time on a prototype cartridge. Even if this is true, why should that count? That's quite a stretch if you ask me. In 2018, a major development came and a player by the name Ursat's Cats destroyed every other time with a 29.97. By barely entering the barn and then hitting the roof, you can get sent backwards out of said barn while still getting a point for going through it. This means that Todd Rogers' time all along could have been possible. But does this make Todd's time any more legit? Well, not really. While Ursatz was probably not the first human to do this on purpose or accidentally, there's no way that one of them was Todd. You'd think that if this was the case, we would 1. have proper proof of his time, and 2. have some type of statement from Todd or someone else talking about said glitch before the 2010s, which of course is non-existent. On top of Todd's already sketchy past, Twin Galaxies has had quite a heavy stance on banning glitches for leaderboards, even to this very day. As of making this, the best non-glitch time with video proof is still a 32.62, still over half a second away from his claimed time. If you thought that was bad though, I am just scratching the surface. Anyone who even knows the name Todd Rogers already knows about Dragster and the 5.51 saga, but let me just get this all out of the way quickly for everyone. I quickly brushed on it earlier, but ever since the 80s, Todd has claimed a time of 5.51. He has time and time again boasted about having the longest held record, and even publications such as Guinness World Records slapped this fact everywhere. The goal of Dragster is to reach the finish line in the shortest distance possible while accelerating and shifting up to four different gears. Time and time again, Todd has made ridiculous claims of how he got this 5.51, such as shifting into second gear right at the very start. Every claim he has made in this regard has been disproven, including in person, right to his face. But no matter what, he has kept pushing this narrative. Eric Koziel, aka OmniGamer, Analyze the game inside and out by using math and code analysis to figure out the perfect dragster run. No matter how it went, his final conclusion was that a 5.57 was the fastest time any human or computer could achieve. 
All of this evidence has completely smashed claims from the game developers that their simulation, which by the way, they won't publicly go into any further detail on, achieved a 5.54 back in the day. On top of this, many other damning things have been pieced together, such as Roger's 5.51 certificate from Activision possibly being a photoshopped version of his 5.64 one. Like I stated before, people have even proved 5.57 is the limit, right to Todd's face. Then Heck met with Rogers and modified simulations with Todd's instructions and couldn't get any further than a 5.57, solidifying Omni's analysis even further. To add further insult to injury, many speedrunners started using Omni's knowledge and put hours and hours of attempts into the game. Omni was the first person to get a 5.57 with video proof, followed by speedrun legend Darbian, who was the first to get it on real hardware. Over 20 people have since tied this with no improvements in sight. You'd think that if a better time was somehow possible, that it would have happened by now. Entering 2018, things were starting to heat up quite a bit. Just three to four months after Omni's initial discoveries, Twin Galaxies removed all of Todd's times, and Guinness World Records followed suit. Even after this, Todd was still spewing some of the same talking points, such as claiming to perform a 5.51 in front of Activision employees in the 80s. So why was every single one of Todd's times removed? Well, let's go over a handful of other times that Todd has claimed over the years. Many of his scores are outlandishly high in comparison to second place, and due to this, people have done math to calculate how long it would have taken for Todd to get some of these supposed scores. His Donkey Kong Jr. score would have taken over 25 hours, his Enduro score over 42 hours, his Journey Escape Time 106 hours, and the most ridiculous one being his Fathom High score being calculated to take 325 hours. Let me just show you the difference here. The current record nowadays by Garrett Holland is 20,541. This run took 30 minutes. Todd claimed to get over 1.1 million points. Yeah. Besides the ridiculous length some of these runs would take, some of his other times have been proven to be flat out unachievable no matter how long you play the game for. For example, Todd claimed a score of 1,698 in the game Wabbit. It's been noticed though that the score can only go up in an increment of 0 or 5. Just look at the rest of the leaderboard. In Legendary Axe, he claimed a time of 99,999,990, when the game only goes up in increments of 50. And I could keep saying the same thing over and over again about different games, and in total, he has had over 1,700 scores wiped across leaderboards, and some other reports have that number a lot higher than that. On top of a lot of these times being ridiculous, none of these scores have video proof attached. Todd has claimed that he sent Twin Galaxies piles of tapes, and if you're not familiar, Twin Galaxy refs back in the day would get sent buckets of tapes full of record submissions. These refs would go through these tapes one by one to verify accuracy of these runs. Many tapes were supposedly temporarily seized by police when Twin Galaxies ref Rob Corcoran was arrested for... Oh, nice. Really nice. Probably not the guy you want to be approving your fake times. On top of that, all his times were later wiped after it was proven that he entered his own scores into the database. If you thought this entire saga would stay in the 2010s, then boy you are wrong. Todd took some inspiration from our boy BM, and on January 29th, 2020, filed what would become one of the most ridiculous lawsuits against Twin Galaxies and Guinness World Records for defamation. Strap in, cause I'm about to shoot a lot of information at you quite quickly, and I already shortened this quite a bit from what it originally was. He entered this lawsuit completely by himself without a lawyer, and the complaint was really poorly written. Billy Mitchell was able to scare Guinness World Records into reinstating his false times with a lawsuit, 
and Todd was expecting things to go exactly the same way for him. The lawsuit sat around until September, until Todd found a lawyer to represent him, but not much really seemed to happen. In May of 2021, Guinness actually notified the court of the appearance of their lawyer, even though they were never properly served by Todd. They also followed with a motion to terminate the lawsuit before it fully went to trial. They argued Todd didn't meet basic requirements for a defamation claim. On top of that, Todd didn't even file the right complaint against the right entity. Todd's lawyer put Guinness World Records Limited on the complaint, which is an English company completely separate from Guinness World Records North America Incorporated. By the end of July, the judge sent a letter basically telling Todd he did everything wrong in the case and never served the defendants which he was supposed to do over an entire year ago. He gave 10 days for Todd to respond to this motion. Moving to August, Todd filed a voluntary dismissal, and the lawsuit was officially closed. But the story is somehow not over though. 10 days after this, his lawyer withdrew from counsel. And then Todd himself sent a letter to the judge claiming the lawyer filed the dismissal without his consent, as well as many other errors. The funniest one being the spelling of his name as Todd Todgers. He asked the judge to file a reversal in the lawsuit, and even sent a second letter wanting to repeat the case. He was getting really desperate at this point. The judge responded that his lawyer didn't file his withdrawal from the council properly, and was still technically Todd's lawyer. Todd's lawyer tried to open back up the case to try and be released from all of this nonsense. In this reopening plea, he claimed Todd was a liar and Todd changed his mind mid-case. What a shocker. I didn't know Mr. 300 hour gaming session could lie. Eventually, things got somewhere with the judge reopening the case just so the lawyer could withdraw. This time the lawyer resubmitted the withdrawal order and the case officially closed. But guess what? This somehow did not shut Todd up. He sent another letter in late September, and then October, to the judge, even when the case was fully closed. The judge surprisingly sent a letter back and told him to stop sending letters and denied reopening the case. To put icing on top of the cake, the final letter denying Todd his request had his name spelt Todd Rogues. Quite a subtle way to say, shut up and stop contacting me. So what have we learned after piecing this all together? Well, while Todd may have had a massive reign over the competitive gaming community and score leaderboards in the 80s and even 90s, with the evolution of the modern internet, it was quite hard to sit behind a mask forever. You can't just sit around for decades on end claiming to have a score that you did 40 years ago. To this very day, there is still not a single video of Todd achieving a record in a single game. The most we will ever see are Polaroid screenshots, which don't even mean much in the 21st century. These can easily be faked. The more Todd has spoken, the more he has buried his own grave. Whether it's hiding behind lost tapes you gave to a criminal, or trying to silence your opponents, nothing he can do from this point will ever paint a good picture for him. As of now, that's all there is to say. Maybe in 2031, we can ask our friend Ron where all those tapes truly went. Assuming that Todd didn't lie about creating and sending those as well. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much as always to all my following YouTube supporters. If you want to also be displayed on screen, you can also join by clicking the join button down below. And I just want to say everyone, I really appreciate you all. Things are going really well. March has been going just as well, honestly, and I think I have some really exciting ideas coming up, and I hope that you guys enjoyed this bit of a different video. Uh, hopefully Todd doesn't get too salty over this. I imagine after the Guinness debacle, he'll never want to touch anything again. But who knows? I mean, I, I honestly would laugh if he actually tried to do anything with this. But uh, yeah, you never know. I'll keep you updated on that. Anyways, stay safe, everyone. And if a gamer knowingly cheats or tries to pull one past us, we will make sure that the score is not recognized.